Hello, and welcome to this perhaps very first ever virtual snow day. Um, in the interest of keeping on schedule, I'll be taking a look today for you at the uh, very famous writing um, by Karl Popper called Science as Falsification. Uh, I say writing, but of course you can tell from the text that it's uh, it's uh, originally delivered as a lecture. It's a it's a transcript of of a, of a speech essentially given in public, uh, and uh, it's become one of the more famous expressions uh, of a very interesting idea that Karl Popper has on a way to distinguish science from stuff that only claims to be science. In other words, from pseudo science. And in fact. Trying to tell the difference between what really is science and what isn't really science uh, is what's referred to in philosophy of science as the problem of demarcation. Uh, demarcation means to separate one side from another. Uh, Popper puts his problem uh, this way. He says, I first began to grapple with the problem. When should a theory be ranked as scientific or is there a criterion for the scientific character or status of a theory? The problem which troubled me at the time was neither when is a theory true nor when is a theory acceptable. My problem was different. I wanted to distinguish between science and pseudoscience, knowing very well that science often errs and that pseudoscience may happen to stumble on the truth. So again, this is a, a very important clarification here because of course everybody who's thought about it uh, long enough has realized that there's a sense in which we don't ever really know whether any of our scientific theories or any theories, frankly, are, are ultimately true. Um, we are of course, we tend to be pretty confident in whatever we uh, have the most support for. Uh, some things we're more confident about, some things we're less confident about. But if you were to walk up to any working scientist and say, so uh, when are you guys just going to be done, right? You know, and then move on to something else, they're, they're going to they're gonna say, well, we're, we're never going to get that way. And the reason why not is, is again, fairly clear when you think about it. Um, we don't have an answer key, right? We don't uh, have like the great book of all truth. You can just sort of look and say, oh, yep, we got it, right? I mean, if we did, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to do any of this work. Um, the reason we're doing all this work is, is simply because we don't know and don't have an answer key. And so again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to continually improve things. Uh, and sometimes that means going down blind alleys here and there, having to reverse direction, having to sort of change our views uh, on this, that, or the other thing. Um, and that's you know uh, what science has generally been pretty successful at doing. Uh, but of course, uh, the question that that Popper wants to answer is what actually makes something scientific, right? Is there some feature of a kind of activity that you could point to and say, all right, that's really a science. This other thing here only claims to be a science or only takes on some of the trappings of science or the appearance of science. Uh, and that, that's it, that is a pseudo science. The word pseudo is a, a prefix, a Greek prefix meaning false. Okay, so a, a, a sort of a fake science in some sense, if you if you want to put it that way. So let's get some idea of just what Popper might mean by trying to tell the difference between science and pseudoscience. So this is going to be something like the family feud portion of the lecture, right? Where if you ask, you know, say a hundred people to name a science or name a pseudoscience or something like that, we're going to be putting a, a, together a something like a representative list. We're not going to be exhaustive. Uh, and so I just, I just wanted to get a few examples out here uh, so that we know more or less what we're talking about here. And I've tried to take uh, some fairly uncontroversial examples. So uh, number one answer for the most part, if you ask somebody to name a pseudoscience is the pseudoscience known as astrology. Okay, uh, notice that's very different than astronomy, which is a branch of physics, right? If you ever really want to annoy uh, an astronomer, uh, uh, get them confused with an astrologer, uh, possibly vice versa. I don't know if astrologers are as spiky about this, but astronomers are not happy when you confuse the two. They'll they'll very quickly and very strongly correct you. Uh, these are very different things. Astronomy, again, as a branch of physics, is the study of stars and planets and you know uh, cosmology and uh, you know, galactic formation and stuff like that, right? All that stuff that's up in, you know, up in space uh, and how it affects us here, here on the ground. Uh, 
uh, astrology, right, is about uh, correlating people's biographies with their um, uh, with the relative positions of the stars and planets uh, as seen from Earth. So uh, that's uh, it's a very different field altogether. Has a different set of methods and has a different go set of goals. Right, so not not at all the same, but astrology again widely regarded uh, as pseudoscience. Astronomy, physics widely regarded as science. Right, pretty uncontroversial there. Uh, parapsychology uh, concerns things like ghosts um, and ESP. Right, so uh, you know psychic research, clairvoyant research, um, etc. Uh, that's uh, all all in parapsychology. Cryptozoology is the study of cryptids. Uh, cryptids are uh, things that are rumored not to exist, okay? And the reason that they're rumored not to exist is because they, in fact, do not exist. Uh, so things like uh, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, um, uh, Bigfoot, right? Although, I guess, I don't know, if, if Bigfoot does exist, I, I think maybe perhaps we just should come to the realization that he's simply blurry, right? I mean, that's, um, but that's that's the idea. Cryptozoology is a study of, of, of essentially things that don't exist that somehow some people are just convinced that they do. Um, it's again, pseudoscientific. Uh, homeopathy uh, is another uh, pseudoscience. It's, it's a, a field that sort of, you know, claims a kind of scientific uh, 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 origin that claims some of the methods of science, you know, uh, but it's a, a kind of alternative medicine in which uh, one of the main ideas is that the more dilute uh, the uh, a medication, uh, the more potent the dose. Uh, so you might, so for example, you might be tempted to take, you know, two ibuprofen tablets instead of one if you don't think one is going to be effective enough. If you're doing that, you're going exactly the opposite way that homeopathy would go. Homeopathy would tell you uh, if you want a more potent dose of ibuprofen, you should take half as much, right? Um, and uh, and that's 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 the idea. It has, has uh, millions of, of adherents, uh, but it is in fact a pseudoscience. Uh, the uh, other sciences, uh, things like psychology, okay, uh, as opposed to parapsychology. Uh, we want to put biology and chemistry in here as, as you know, kind of rounding out the big three of biology, chemistry, and physics uh, that most people will, you know, recognize from any sort of school curriculum. Uh, but I also want to add economics and anthropology here. Uh, I don't. I want to make it clear that we're not restricting our attention here just to the physical sciences, though of course we do already have psychology in there. Uh, the social sciences like economics, like anthropology, uh, are uh, have, have every right to be called sciences. Again, their, their, their methods are appropriate, right? And now of course, that's, this is all gonna raise the question, what is it that makes all of those things on the left really sciences and what makes all of these things over here uh, pseudosciences? Um, well, you know, that's again uh, what Popper's going to address. But I want to add a few more uh, points to the pseudoscience list here because these are examples that Popper himself uses. And I think those examples are not super familiar uh, to a more recent reader. Uh, he, uh, Popper adds the examples of Freudian psychoanalysis uh, as the work of, of the uh, Austrian uh, uh, a therapist Sigmund Freud, uh, the uh, Adlerian psychology, which is uh, uh, due to, again, the Austrian uh, uh, Alfred Adler. Uh, I should mention Karl Popper himself is Austrian, and so the Austrians are going to be popping up all over the, all over the place in this lecture. Uh, and of course, uh, the Marxist theory of history. These are, these are examples that Popper himself points to as examples of pseudosciences, and so uh, we're going to be taking a look at those just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of what they are, if, uh, again, because I assume that they're not as familiar as some of these other examples might be. And then we're going to turn our attention to what is the real difference between sciences and pseudosciences, um, you know, with these kinds of examples uh, motivating us. I should also say at this point that uh, there is a whole third category that I have not listed here, and that is non-sciences, okay? So sciences are, are you know, things as listed here, pseudosciences are as listed here, uh, and there's a whole bunch of things that just don't fit into the discussion at all because they don't even make a claim to be science, okay? So baseball is a non-science, right? Philosophy is a non-science. It neither claim, it doesn't claim to be scientific, it's just not a science, right? Literature, music, uh, you know, mathematics actually is, is it, all of these things are non-sciences, right? They're not sciences, they don't claim to be sciences. The 
difference between a science and a pseudoscience is going to be that a science claims to be a science and is one. A pseudoscience sort of claims to be a science and isn't one for some reason or other. Those reasons, of get, again, uh, will, will be addressed by Popper. All right, so let's take a look at some of these examples of the pseudosciences that Popper brings up. So the first of these is Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, and this is here a, a picture of the famous doctor. Uh, I, I would say that out of the three that he mentions, uh, Freudian uh, thought is probably most well known these days uh, out, of, out of all those three. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it was very famous uh, in his day. And, and we're just going to take a look at some of the some of the bigger some of the bigger ideas that will be relevant to our discussion. Uh, so, again, there's there's the doctor with his famous cigar. Uh, one of the things that Freud is pretty famous for uh, is the idea that, uh, first off, the personality, the human personality, is divided up into various different sections, right? Uh, in this case, the ego, the id, and the superego, right? The id being responsible for a lot of sort of desires and passions and urges, right? Uh, the superego being responsible for things like rules, rationality, to some degree, degree morality, um, and uh, the ego being the force that sort of has to mediate between these two uh, sort of different uh, sort of you know, polar uh, opposites in some sense. Uh, also important to Freud's uh, uh, thinking about uh, about human psychology is that uh, he thought that it was a lot that was going on at the unconscious or uh, or pre-conscious level, right, uh, as opposed to just the conscious. And so uh, the idea is that there's more going on uh, than is uh, obvious uh, even to the person whose you know whose mind it is, right? and that's a, a very important Freudian idea. In fact, Freud's ideas have had a large impact on screenwriting. Right, uh, screenwriters of various generations have been taught uh, to to use right some of these Freudian insights to specifically externalize people's internal conflict. And so I'm going to use one of my favorite examples of this uh, as an illustration. Uh, if you see here, here's a, a, a picture of the very fiery, very emotional uh, Dr. McCoy from the uh, uh, from the, the the original Star Trek television series, uh, and. Uh, here is then a picture of the coolly logical, rational uh, Mr. Spock, right, the science officer. And uh, then, of course, we've got, uh, you know, Kirk, who's in charge, right, you know, uh, trying to mediate between these various influences. So rather than, than Kirk himself having a kind of internal conflict between his emotions and between logic uh, and, and various other aspects of personality between, you know, sort of, you know, rationality and, 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 and passion and various other things like that uh they've they've often they've often had the, have these characters even almost look like hovering over you know over each shoulder like the uh, little the little angel and the little devil from the cartoons or something like that uh, again a way of of externalizing a kind of internal conflict and so they have you know kirk very explicitly here uh instead of having having a kind of problem inside his mind they're getting it outside of his mind by having his passions on one hand and his sort of cool reason on the other sort of arguing with each other and he's got to mediate between the two of them it's a, a very much an example of a uh, sort of freudian style of screenwriting all right so uh, uh this here is alfred adler another austrian uh, you'll notice here that uh, Adler, uh, who Popper knew, Popper knew uh, uh, both Freud and Adler. I know Adler pretty well, actually. Uh, uh, you'll notice Adler here uh, also has a, a kind of mustache uh, that has gone out of favor. Uh, once upon a time, Austrian men, uh, it was fairly common to have a mustache of, of this style, but another Austrian-born person sort of ruined that one for everybody. Uh, and so now, uh, anytime you see this, in fact, people would simply call it a Hitler mustache, right? Um, but uh, uh, again, once upon a time, it was fairly common for, for uh, Austrian men to sort of, you know, wear uh, their, their mustaches this way. Um, again, you know, it, it doesn't take, a, you know, sometimes, you know, a, a really bad egg can, can ruin a whole lot of things for a whole lot of people. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, mustaches included. Uh, Anyway, that this is Alfred Adler. Okay, Alfred Adler was also a, a, a psychologist. He was also interested in studying the human mind and human behavior. Uh, some of his ideas are certainly less famous uh, than Freud's, but do kind of stick around. Uh, he had some ideas about birth order that have, have sort of stuck around. Uh, I would say his most famous idea 
that has stuck around is the uh, idea of the inferiority complex, right? Um, you know, here we have uh, you know some books written about inferiority complexes, uh, some nice little cartoons, right? This person complaining, everyone else's inferiority complex is better than mine, right? Um, which is um, ironic, right? So in general, uh, an inferiority complex is, you know, when somebody sort of uh, acts to try and, and compensate for some perceived shortcoming of theirs, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, when people talk about overcompensating for this, that, or the other thing, uh, they're very much getting at the kind of thing that Adler uh, very much uh, studied, thought was important, and, and popularized. And finally, uh, we're going to take a look at the Marxist view of history. Remember, this is the third example of a pseudoscience that uh, Popper himself uses. And uh, this one, again, is, is very, very famous, um, but, but it's less well known, especially, I would say, among American audiences. And, and part of that is because uh, a study of Marx uh, in, in, you know, fairly recent times even still uh, has been something like, you know, politically fraught, right? You know, uh, uh, you don't want to study Marx. That's, that's just not American, right? Um, when honestly, it, it's it's pretty hard to understand the the whole first half of the 20th century, um, and and certainly the late 19th century without understanding something about Marx and Marxism. Um, these are these are they're 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 just major issues. Uh, it would. Uh, um, you know, it, it's a, it's it's pretty important. So I'm going to try and give you uh, the nutshell version of this, although you, you you really should understand. I I myself am no great Marx expert. Uh, now, before moving on, I do want to mention that uh, the 19th century was a really great century, uh, especially for um, men's styling of hair and, and facial hair, right? I mean, if you think that this looks eccentric, just start looking around at, say, for example, find a photo of uh, President uh, Grant's cabinet, right? Uh, I mean, I think some historians have uh, labeled that the absolute hairiest cabinet in American history. Um, look through like a Civil War photo album, uh, and you'll see all kinds of tremendously creative of uses of hair uh, uh, that's you know the 19th century really excelled in this uh, you know if you've seen sort of modern day hipsters do crazy things with their hair and with their especially facial hair uh, you really haven't it's it's still not approaching the levels of the 19th century We're working our way back there but you know it's it's not gonna not gonna really do it. in fact uh, who knows where we'd be today if this trend had been allowed to continue uh, one of the things that very strongly influenced men's fashion in the early 20th century was uh, at least in europe anyway um and uh, and uh, areas influenced by europe uh, uh was was the the outbreak of the first world war and one of the things is you can't get a, a gas mask to seal properly uh if you have uh, a lot of facial hair and so it became regulation for uh, men in the military to be clean shaven all the time, uh, and that that you know m military does tend to have a large impact on sort of men's fad and fads and fashions, especially with mass mobilizations and things like that. And so it sort of started a trend of clean shavenness that uh, is only now uh, sort of somewhat abating. Um, but in any case, the yeah 19th century quite hairy, um, and yeah that's Marx. So let's let's uh, say talk a little about about his theory itself. Marx had the idea of treating history more or less like a science. And if that sounds a little funny right at first, uh, let's hear it actually described, and then it's going to sound a lot less funny and uh, in the sense of strange, right? Uh, in fact, most people at some point have the temptation to treat history more or less as a science. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the things that uh, historians will try and uh, encourage you not to do for a whole variety of very good reasons. Um, but, uh, but this is more or less how it works. If you think that uh, things sort of had to happen more or less the way that they did, or that there are some large scale historical forces that have caused things to turn out how they've turned out and caused things to happen how they've happened, and that you can sort of learn something about what the future is likely to be like by studying what the past has been like, uh, you're, you're already kind of there, right? That's very much uh, some of these ideas of what's sometimes called historicism, right? Or, or um, you know, sort of scientific historicism, sometimes people might call it. Uh, but it's, again, the idea that these sort of large-scale historical forces are kind of like laws of nature, kind of like the scientific laws that are studied by chemists and physicists and economists and uh, anthropologists, okay? So uh, 
uh, and and you know there's there are some gray areas there uh, I'll you know I'll have to say but uh, Marx's specific version of this uh, was based on what he called a dialectical process, right? Now, a dialectic is just um, uh, the name for a kind of intellectual process that has been used many, many, many times by many, many, many people, and there's there's nothing wrong with it, right? A, a dialectical process is one where you start with a thesis, right, an idea in a sense. And then what you do is you look for you look at the opposite of that idea and you look for the tension in between the two or you try and figure out which of the two is, is sort of more correct. And you might find out that there's some nuance there where uh, the idea is that some parts of your thesis were correct, but some parts of the antithesis were correct. And so what you do is you maybe form a new idea out of those. Uh, this is referred to as the synthesis. And then, of course, you look for a new opponent to that idea to sort of test it out. And then from that uh, that sort of adversarial process of, you know, point, count, Counterpoint, you end up with uh, more and more new ideas, and it, and it continues, right? That's a dialectic process of investigating something. And again, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's it's just a a way of thinking. Uh, the way that Marx applied it to history was uh, was in a very specific way. And again, this is the nickel version. This is the nutshell version. Uh, Marx thought that uh, that class conflict. Uh, was specifically one of the the, the forces that that causes caused this large scale historical change and transformation. Uh, so one way of putting it is that uh, way back in the day, right, uh, you have uh, essentially human lo lots of human slavery, and especially in a lot of ancient societies. Uh, certainly, the Roman world uh, is is a you know a very much a slaveholding society, um, and uh, was very conscious of class on top of it. Uh, and so, in a sense, if you think of it that way. Uh, the slaves are generally the people doing all the work, and the slave owners are the people having all the fun. And if you're one of the slaves, that really sucks, of course, and causes all kinds of conflict between the the owners of the means of production and the laborers, that is, those who are actually doing all the producing, right? And so that kind of conflict, uh, Marx theorizes, uh, inevitably moves into a different phase, right, where uh, you get into something like feudalism, okay, where there's a kind of conflict between those who own land, right, and so in feudalism, it's the land that's all owned by uh, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 the leisure classes, right, the sort of rent-seeking elites, as uh, um, uh, political historians call them, and the people who are essentially doing all the work, that is, the, uh, the serfs, uh, these people who are tied to the land and sort of have to pay rent in order to farm the land uh, that they live on. They do, and so again, if you're the one, if you're one of the serfs, if you're one of the people doing all the work uh, instead of the people just owning all the land, collecting all the rent, uh, well, that really sucks. So um, you know, there's again all of this class conflict, which again Mark thinks inevitably leads to a kind of development of uh, sort of a proto-capitalism, right? The idea where uh, you know social structures develop where uh, people are you know no longer serfs, they're sort of you know freed from land, they're no longer slaves, um, but instead what happens is that the 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 upper classes, the bourgeoisie, right, uh, own businesses and factories, right? And uh, it's the people who work in the businesses and factories that are in some sense uh, sort of wage slaves. And, and they're still exploited in, in a very similar way uh, to the way that serfs or slaves were exploited. It's just, again, done and under a different structure. Um, and it's, you know, perhaps somewhat better, but it's still, you know, if it, still, if you're one of the people doing all the work instead of one of the people owning all the things, uh, if you are one of the laborers, uh, as opposed to one of the owners of the means of production, in this case, businesses and factories, then again, that sucks and uh, leads to a lot of class conflict. And uh, uh, Marx thought the next inevitable phase in all this was a phase where, uh, through a long series of bloody revolutions, etc., cetera, uh, uh, society would change its character until finally, finally, Right, the uh, workers themselves would own the means of production, right? And of course, what that means is, you know, has a, there's a there's a lot of that, right? You know, does it mean planned economy? Well, maybe, maybe not. Does it mean something like employee-owned businesses? Well, we have those, right? Uh, does it mean something like communes or co-ops? Well, again, we have those too. Um, and so uh, it's. Um, 
you know, it, it's that's you know this this is where the picture gets it's much more complicated than I can really do it justice. And of course, uh, it's even even up to this point more complicated than I have really done it justice. But again, that's the nickel version, that's the the nutshell version. And you should always be suspicious of something that could be explained in about five and a half minutes. Um, but 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 there you go. That's the, the notion is uh, Marx essentially trying to treat history like a science, right? Talking about these sort of large scale forces acting more or less like natural laws. Um, and that's what uh, what Popper here is going to focus on uh, in, in in using the Marxist theory of history as an example. So finally, we get to the point where uh, now the question is, what's the difference, right? What is the difference between the sciences so listed and the pseudosciences so listed? What is it that, that all of the sciences have that all of the pseudosciences lack? Or what is it that all of the pseudosciences have that all of the sciences lack, right? Uh, because if there's a difference, it has to be one of those two things. There has to be something about the sciences that the pseudosciences don't have, or something about the pseudosciences that the sciences don't have, right? Um, one or the other. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, there. It's a, this is a tricky, tricky issue. And I, I want you to stop for a minute, if necessary, really pause the video and start to think, you know, what really is the difference uh, between sciences and pseudosciences here? Uh, what's the difference in the method, right? Again, if you came here from Mars, how would you tell the difference between a science and a pseudoscience? What sort of principled reason could you apply here? Um, it's a very, very thorny problem uh, and one that uh, I think, you know, Popper uh, was, was absolutely right to focus on in terms of being a difficult but also an important issue. Well, a variety of answers might occur to you. And one answer that occurs to a lot of people uh, is the idea of uh, being sort of mathy, okay, or involving a lot of a, a lot of measurement and, and mathematicsness, right, or something like that, for lack of a better term. Well, as, again, as it turns out, this one's not going to be a great way to tell the difference between sciences and pseudosciences, right? Uh, again, remember, math itself is not a science. Uh, math tends to be used by many sciences, some very much more than others. Uh, but uh, but math itself is is uh, you know not not a science. It's 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 its own thing. It's it's its own field. Uh, you don't do math experiments, right? Uh, math doesn't generally rely on observation in any way, whereas sciences tend to. Uh, but uh, just as a kind of counterexample here, this is uh, a sample birth chart um, that I uh, just found real fast on the internet. And uh, it, doesn't that look pretty mathy, uh, you know? Uh, and so it's not the case that the sciences involve, you know, numerical reasoning and observation and the pseudosciences do not. Many of the pseudosciences clearly use some form of numerical reasoning. They make use of, of mathematics. Um, again, you know, so, so that, that in itself can't really be a difference between the two. So we're left looking for other candidates. And so uh, Popper puts it this way, he says, Thus, what worried me was neither the problem of truth, at that stage at least, nor the problem of exactness or measurability. I think that's what most people are thinking of when they think of, uh, you know, math being a, a sort of key issue. Popper continues, it was rather that I felt that these other three theories, uh, meaning the three that we just talked about, though posing as science, had in fact more in common with primitive myths than with science, that they resembled astrology rather than astronomy. All right, I'll say more about what he means by that. But let's look for another candidate. Another idea that some people have is that they, they say, well, look, you know, we've got all of this great technology, right? The technology proves the effectiveness of the science uh, and possibly vice versa uh, that, at some risk of circularity. Um, but first of all, let's make a real distinction here between science and technology, because again, they are very different things and they stand or fall separately from one another. Uh, we've really only had something that could legitimately dis be described as science for, you know, a couple, 300 years at most. Uh, and we've had technology considerably longer. I mean, you know, uh, stone hand axes going back, you know, 100,000 years or more. Um, 
uh, that's technology, right? Control of fire is technology. You know, walls, agriculture, writing. I mean, all of these things are technologies. Um, and of course, we have lots of high or advanced technology these days. Uh, and 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 no doubt technology has had a large influence on the practice of science and the practice of science has had a large influence on technology but again they're not essentially the same thing uh, consider do you have to fundamentally understand the nature of the universe in order to make a washing machine that works right again thank goodness no uh, and on the other hand does making a washing machine that works mean that you necessarily understand anything basic about the universe right again not necessarily right when you think about it that way so again technologies and sciences do stand or fall uh, do not stand or fall together right they stand or fall separately but to the question do all sciences involve the use of technology but none of the pseudo sciences well clearly not a good counterexample would be here where uh you know here's a crew of parapsychologists that have some quite fancy technology indeed and this is the most common one. Uh, this is the most common thing that people will say. They will say, well, but the sciences are all true and the pseudosciences are all false. Well, number one, how do we know? Where's the, our answer key? Okay, again, uh, Popper very clearly right at the beginning of the lecture pointed out that sometimes sciences make mistakes. That's, that's inevitable. And that it may well be that at least some pseudoscience happened to stumble on the truth. Right. And so, again, you know, being true or not is, is you know, uh, we, we just don't know. Right. Um, I think that, you know, if you take a look at all the problems we've had finding, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, knowledge, truth from earlier in the course, I think you'll see uh, some of the reason why we've had so much trouble with this one. But if you just want to think about confirming evidence, right, evidence that seems to be in favor of uh, the sciences versus the pseudosciences, this is something that Popper very much wants to draw our attention to uh, and get us off of, of this idea that confirmation is the difference. Uh, in fact, uh, one, one way of illustrating the issue is by comparing something like, say, a horoscope to something like a weather forecast. Okay. And in fact, I went and clipped out uh, quite literally today's uh, horoscope for me, for myself. I'm, I'm a Gemini, right? Uh, so it says here, as a Gemini, your social life is a key element in your world. It's been easy for you to fall out of touch lately. Right? Well, my goodness, I, 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 I normally, you know, um, I normally am, am, am in touch with all of you, my students, uh, and today, not so much, right? Things were, were canceled. I don't know how they knew. Um, Monday's skies, huh? a weather issue, okay? Remind you of the importance of reconnecting with your crew as the moon dances through excitable areas. Well, I'm not sure what that means, but, but it says Luna spends the day in a series of uplifting connections as she aligns with messenger Mercury and aspirational Jupiter. It's a great day for putting any group-related plans into action. And look here, I'm recording a video for the group of groups of my students. Um, case closed, right? Con confirmed, okay? It's, it's a... Uh, I, I, I can't even, uh, it, it's a beautiful fit with, with, with my actual day. Whereas, um, you know, weather forecasts for at least today have been, you know, fairly accurate, but I think we've all had many, many circumstances in which they have not. Okay. So again, think of it this way. I mean, it, it, do an experiment, see which is more accurate or more often confirmed your horoscope or your weather forecast. And again, meteorology is pretty uncontroversially scientific and uh, astrology is pretty uncontroversially pseudo-scientific. Uh, so again, it, it's, it, confirmation is just not going to be the difference between the two. Let's say a little bit more about that issue because it is a very important one in Popper's article. Uh, Popper put it this way. He said, the most characteristic element in this situation seemed to me the incessant stream of confirmations okay. of observations which verified the theories in question and this point was constantly emphasized by their adherents a marxist could not open a newspaper without finding on every page confirming evidence for his interpretation of history not only in the news, but also in its presentation, which revealed the class bias of the paper, and especially, of course, what the paper did not say. 
The Freudian analysts emphasize that their theories were constantly verified by their, quote, clinical observations. Right. So, again, you would think that confirmation would be a very important thing to a science and uh, that that would be the difference between the sciences and the pseudosciences. Not so. Right. In fact, it seems to be the very reverse. Uh, uh, Popper here is talking about this incessant stream of confirmations like th these are all theories that explain everything. Right. You can get confirmations all over the place. Everything constantly keeps confirming them. Right. So consider, for example, another example. Uh, a famous piece of uh, one of you know, some of some of Freud's thinking, um, and that has to do with what uh, is called uh, an, an Oedipus complex. So Freud had this idea, okay, that um, uh, males, right, men, uh, grew up wanting to uh, having this desire to uh, murder their fathers and marry their mothers, right? And that uh, for the most part, uh, uh, by the time men are grown, they have fully suppressed this desire, some more effectively than others, but you, that you could explain a lot about especially male behavior by appealing to this kind of, uh, again, as it's called Oedipus complex. The reason he called it an Oedipus complex is because the Greek, the character from Greek tragedy, Oedipus, in fact, did kill his father and marry his mother. But crucially, uh, it's important to point out that he did that not he, he didn't actually he did it because he didn't want to right that so he, he killed his father and married his mother because he didn't want to kill his father and he didn't want to marry his mother um, and that's that's a, a common theme in greek tragedy you know people trying to avoid their fate and thus making it worse um but uh in case you're you're not familiar with the story just a, a quick the quick two minute version um so uh oedipus is born um uh to uh a, a, uh, you know his 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 parents here, uh, King Laos, and I'm I'm uh, now uh, Yocasta, I believe, his mother's name. Uh, I have to pull that one from the deep memory. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, they have you know baby Oedipus, and uh, uh, it comes to pass that they learn of baby baby Oedipus's fate, which you know in general, if you have children, never do that. Uh, don't learn their fate. Just just you know makes you able to be more zen about everything. Uh, and so what happened was he, you know, it was revealed he was fated to kill his father and marry his mother. And they were like, well, <laughs> that sucks. So they, um, you know, so so the king hands over um, uh, baby Oedipus to one of his underlings and says, OK, take care of this problem for me. Go, you know, go kill the baby. Right now, if you're a miserable underling, of course, you always get the worst jobs. And, uh, you know, this is it has to be, you know, one of one of even fiction's uh, worst henchman jobs ever. And so the henchman has this, you know, an infant so like he's like, I don't want, like, you know, it's like, my goodness, right? You know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, what you hope that all henchmen eventually realize, you're like, my God, I think I'm working for the bad guy, right? Um, you know, there, there's a, a big clue. So in a sense, he disobeys the order, right? You know, he, he sort of says, you know, I'm going to pretend to follow orders here, um, which is, uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, is the, the bane of all, you know, real uh, doers of evil is that their henchmen sometimes uh, decide to, uh, you know, uh, grow consciences, right? And uh, so uh, instead, he sort of, you know, as a friend of a friend of a friend or whatever, and, and it sort of, you know, passes off the baby and says, he, you know, find, finds a couple that really wants the baby. And it happens to be this uh, king, king and queen of some other place. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, they, they sort of adopt, they raise a, a, a baby Oedipus as their own, never say a thing about it, right? They keep it uh, really under the lid. And so then as it comes about um, uh, over time, uh, uh, Oedipus learns of his fate uh, and, uh, you know, he's like... But I love my mom and, you know, I love my dad. They're great people. I don't want to I don't want to kill my father. I don't want to marry my mother. That's gross. And so he runs away from home and, uh, you know, sort of on the road at sort of a crossroads. He ends up coming across some dude and that dude's crew and uh, in sort of an ancient uh, example of like road rage or whatever, uh, he ends up killing them all, <laughs> um, you know, including uh, Laos, who is his father right he didn't know but he does you know does kill this guy then he continues on the road um and he sort of continues to thebes uh, and thebes is actually uh 
they're having a, a sphinx problem. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things that you have to do when you're having a sphinx problem, you have to have people solve the riddles of the sphinxes, right? And so uh, the sphinx, you know, presents a riddle and, and a very clever Oedipus does solve the riddle. You'll also notice that in these uh, sort of classical era paintings, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, more like Renaissance era paintings of, of these classical, you know, uh, uh, events uh, you'll notice that that clothing technology isn't necessarily what it should have been right uh, i mean in the absence of sort of velcro um, buttons uh, zippers hooks um, uh, ties you know you figure they would have had at least ties maybe i think they had belts but not necessarily belt buckles right so um you know just worthless right so uh yeah you'll notice that the the clothing technology is is uh, really uh, uh you know not great here in any case, uh, Oedipus does solve the riddle of the Sphinxes, and they leave or whatever, and, and the people of Thebes are like, yay, Oedipus, you know what, we're missing our king, you know what, you should be king, right? And so, um, you know, he's like, well, okay, I'll take that, it sounds like a pretty good outcome for running away from home. Um, and so he, you know, ends up marrying the queen, right? You know, I no one's seen the king in a while. Uh, this is a Queen Yokasa, who's his mom. Gross, right? And uh, they, it, it's kind of a long time before they figure out what's going on, and there are some kids and everything. Um, and so it's, uh, um, it's, it's quite decent. So, but, but as time goes on, you know, sort of one clue drops after another here and there, and uh, you know, eventually, uh, uh, you know, Oedipus sort of figures it out. It becomes plain what has happened that he has in fact killed his father and married his mother and. Uh, so then he gouges his eyes out, and that's the end of that particular play. There are some plays about his children uh, that are also um, tragedies. So, anywho, that's uh, that's the story. So and that, that's that's the Oedipus thing. Uh, really apropos of nothing, but uh, you know, again, just a little bit of cultural literacy for you. So in any case, uh, the the example is supposed to be as follows, right? The point is we were talking about confirmation. So. You know, imagine, you know, Dr. Freud says, well, you know, uh, you know, all these, you know, all men have this desire to kill their fathers, marry their mothers. And I say, you know what, Sigmund, I, uh, I love my mom, but gross, right? Uh, and, you know, I, my dad and I have not always had, uh, you know, agreed about everything, but my goodness, right? You know, he's a good guy. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to kill my father. You know, I've never had any desire to kill my father, right? And um, so, what he's going to say is he's going to say, aha, this confirms my theory, right? My theory is that that all men repress this urge and you are showing all the signs of repression, you know, um, and, and all that sort of stuff, right? So, I mean, it's it's uh, going to be, you know, this, this great aha moment. It's going to completely confirm his theory, right? But now imagine I were to say instead, well, look, Ziggy, uh, I have a confession to make. I secretly have always wanted to kill my father and uh, always wanted to marry my mother. Ha ha ha. Right. And of course, he's going to say, aha, this confirms my theory. OK, so if admitting uh, the to the, the, the this desire uh, confirms a the theory and and denying this desire confirms his theory, you might wonder what doesn't confirm his theory. And that that is the problem with confirmation uh, as any kind of a basis for adopting uh, any kind of a view whatsoever, not just a scientific theory. Confirmation is super, super easy and doesn't all by itself mean anything except that you can confirm something with something else. That's all it means. And so uh, Popper puts the issue this way. He said, what I had in mind was that his previous observations may not have been much sounder than this new one. And here he's talking about some of, some of Adler's uh, work here. That each in its turn had been interpreted in light of previous evidence and at the same time counted as additional confirmation. What, I asked myself, did it confirm? no more than that a case could be interpreted in light of a theory. But this meant very little, I reflected, since every conceivable case could be interpreted in the light of Adler's theory or equally of Freud's. Right? Elsewhere in the article, Popper gives this example of a man who you know, saves a child from drowning, right? He says, Adler explains this by saying the man, you know, had the psychological need to prove to himself that he dared to do something bold, like rescue the child. Whereas the person who pushes the child, child into the water with the, you know, intention of drowning him, uh, 
Adler explains this action by saying that the man uh, had a desire, you know, had a need to prove to himself that he could do something bold like pushing a child into the water to drown him. So if these completely opposite kinds of behavior get the same explanation and both confirm this kind of a theory, uh, again, if that's what's going on, how much is that confirmation really worth? You know, what is it really adding to our understanding of anything? And again, this should be the major lesson you should take. Uh, confirmation all by itself is just not valuable, not in the sciences, not anywhere, right? Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't do enough. So now what Popper is going to do is he's going to illustrate the other side of the coin, right? Um, he, you know, he says it this way. He says, with Einstein's theory, the situation was strikingly different. Take one typical instance, Einstein's prediction just then confirmed by the findings of Eddington's expedition. This is a very famous scientific result, one of the very most famous scientific results of all time, but still it's a possible, it's possible you, you've not heard of it. And so I'm going to try and explain what's going on here with Eddington's observations and uh, with, with what that did with uh, some of Einstein's theories. Okay, so here's how that works. One of the consequences of some of Einstein's theories is that light should be affected by gravity. Okay, this is contrary to what Newton thought. Newton thought that light simply traveled in straight lines, period, right? That there shouldn't be anything that would affect the straight line trajectory of light. Okay, that's just the way it is. And so this is a meaningful difference between, uh, between Einstein and Newton on this specific point. So again, uh, if Einstein were correct, what that, what that would mean is that as starlight sort of, uh, you know, passed by the sun, which is the most massive thing anywhere near us, uh, that in a very small way, this, this, this chart here is an exaggeration, of course, but in a really, really small way, that light would get bent a little bit by the sun's gravity. Because even though the sun is really, really big, it's not, you know, it's not that big. It's going to bend some, some light, but not, not radically, right? And so the point is that the actual position of a star and the apparent position of a star when when it's, you know, uh, when its light has to pass very close to the sun, you know, uh, on its way to us, um, you know, would be influenced a little bit. So you, you, there should be a difference between the apparent position of the star and the actual position of the star if the light does bend. If not, there would be no difference, right? Uh, you know, the, the apparent position and the actual position of the star would, would just line right up. Um, you know, light would just travel in straight lines like Newton said. Uh, now, of course, this is a thing you, you got to check. You, you, there's no, there's no, you know, reasoning that says, well, you know, there's a reason why. No, no, no. You just got to check. And that's what Eddington did. Uh, the trouble with trying to make this observation is that you can't see the stars that are right next to the sun, right? They're there, right? All the stars are out during the daytime. It's just that the sun is bright enough to drown them out. You can't, you know, you can't see them. Uh, you can't make observations of them. And, uh, you know, and there's one exception to this, and that is during an eclipse. During an eclipse, you can see the stars that are right, right next to the sun, uh, you know, while the sun is out, right? Uh, and so this is, this is a, a, you know, so eclipses like this, total eclipses, are not super rare, right? They happen fairly regularly. It's just that you tend to have to travel somewhere to see them. Uh, and so Eddington actually spent several times, he, you know, tried several times to get some really good images. And of course, you know, the, the travel was sometimes really hard. Uh, the conditions sometimes weren't favorable. Like you get somewhere and it's cloudy. Well, what you're going to do, right? You got to go to the next one. Um, and so Eddington, uh, you know, was, was pretty uh, dogged about this, uh, about getting the right photographs. He eventually did. And what you do is you take this photograph of all of the stars you, that, you know, uh, that you see during the eclipse, uh, you know, where the starlight had to, you know, say in some cases, you know, like say with, you know, these stars that are really close to the, the, the corona here, like there, 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 right? All these things. What you do is you have to sort of make note of which stars those are, right? And, and exactly, you know, what their relative position are relative to everything else's because if if their light's getting bent just a little bit by having you know passed close to the sun on the way here um, then you'll be able to compare them with this the photo a photograph of the same patch of stars really you know uh, without the sun in the way okay without the the sun there and so the starlight it not passing by the sun and the starlight passing by the sun uh, if there are changes well then Einstein is right if there are not changes well, Newton was right as it turns out, they did the observation, uh, and Eddington's uh, observations confirmed that Einstein's theory um, was correct, or rather, I should say that it indicated that Newton's theory was incorrect, right? It sort of it refutes one theory uh, while adding some, some important evidence to another.
So that's a kind of confirmation, but what makes that important is, is a number of very uh, uh, key features. Uh, and Popper puts it this way, he says, the impressive thing about this case is the risk involved in a prediction of this kind, that is, in Einstein's prediction that, that uh, gravity ought to curve the path of starlight. If observation shows that the predicted effect is definitely absent, then the theory is simply refuted. The theory is incompatible with certain ideas, uh, certain possible results of observation. In fact, with results which everybody before Einstein would have expected. Okay, so this is an important thing. Einstein said, here's something that ought to happen. Um, you wouldn't think it would happen based on what we understood previously. And uh, if it doesn't happen, if you sort of, you know, make an observation and that's not what goes on, well, then I'm just wrong. Okay, that's that's a, a, a sort of a striking feature that that really sort of captured Popper's imagination in this case and, and offered him what he thought was a reasonable answer to this problem of demarcation, this problem of trying to tell the difference between sciences and pseudosciences. And so finally, he uh, arrives at this set of criteria, right? He says, uh, the, these are the criteria, right, of the scientific status of a theory, as he puts it, is its falsifiability or refutability or testability, right? Now, one common mistake sometimes people will make here is think that the word falsifiable means false. No, no, no. A good scientific theory isn't false, but it should be falsifiable. That is, there should be some circumstances under which some evidence would prove it wrong, right? If there isn't any evidence that could prove a theory wrong, that theory is a waste of time. Right. So he tries to summarize this with these sort of, you know, these principles of rules of when a confirmation is important, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, to intellectual life, right, to science especially. And so his first principle here, right, is, 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 is very key here. It's easy to obtain confirmations if we look for confirmations. And that's what he thinks that the Marxist historian was doing. That's what he thinks uh, Freudians were doing. That's what he thinks Adlerians were doing. They were simply looking for confirmations. And every time they found one, they thought, that's it, we're, we're, we're done, we're gold. This is, this is surely the theory that explains everything, right? And uh, Popper points out that these confirmations should only count if they are the result of risky predictions. That is to say, if unenlightened by the theory in question, we should have expected an event which was incompatible with the theory, an event which would have refuted the theory. Okay. And so he says a confirmation is only important, right, if it's not what you would have expected, and if the theory risks itself making that prediction. That is, you say, okay, well, here's what my theory would say, and if that's not the case, well, then my theory is wrong. If that's the approach you're taking toward it, then and only then, Popper says, are you taking a real scientific approach as opposed to a pseudo-scientific approach. Right. He continues, he says, every good scientific theory is a prohibition. It forbids certain things from happening. The more a theory forbids, the better it is. A theory that is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. He says, irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. And that's, I think, a very important insight. Right? It's not important that some theory always be right. What's important is that it has not yet been shown wrong, and there has been some very serious effort to show that it that it's wrong. Right? That's that's going to be some evidence that seems to be pretty important. Right? And in fact, he says, what should scientists be doing? He says, look, every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify or refute it. Okay. So uh, his idea of what scientists do, but that pseudoscientists do not, is that scientists try to show that their views are false. They try to refute their own views as opposed to trying to confirm their own views. Because again, it's easy to obtain confirmations, so easy that those confirmations are simply worthless. Right. And again, he says this confirming evidence should not count except when it's the result of a genuine test of the theory. Right. And this means that it can be presented as a serious but unsuccessful attempt to falsify the theory. 
So he says the only kinds of confirmation should matter was when you were trying to falsify a theory and failed. There you've got confirming evidence that kind of seems to matter. But again, it doesn't settle the issue, right? Even that kind of confirming evidence shouldn't convince you of the ultimate truth of some particular theory. But that method seems to count as a genuinely scientific method. The, fa the last thing he points out, he says that some genuinely testable theories, when they're found to be false, are still upheld by their admirers. For example, by introducing ad hoc, some auxiliary assumption, or by reinterpreting the theory ad hoc in such a way that escapes uh, refutation. Right. This principle, uh, this this term ad hoc is a sort of, you know, comes from the Latin. Um, it, it essentially uh, means to, to uh, haphazardly or uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, sort of reinterpret a theory without without any grounds except for just, you know, having a goal of preserving it. Right. Or something like that. This is uh, the sense of what he means here. Um, what's funny is that I'm not sure there's a better English phrase than ad hoc, <laughs> right? Uh, then uh, that, that really means uh, what we want this to mean. Uh, the idea is, he says, such a procedure is always possible, but it rescues the theory from refutation only at the price, price of destroying or at least lowering its scientific status. Again, as soon as a theory stops sticking its neck out, in other words, it stops really being scientific or at least becomes much less scientific. Um, and that's, uh, again, I think important enough, right? Um, you can rescue a theory from refutation or attempted refutation only by destroying or at least lowering its scientific status. And so at the end here, uh, remember the point of taking a look at this piece, right? We've uh, so far in this unit seen a, a lot of difficulties in uh, a lot of barriers in the way of uh, gaining knowledge, right? Of trying to find the truth. There's a lot of things that we thought were, you know, very obviously reliable, like our senses, like induction, uh, that we found to be anything but obviously reliable, but to be, you know, some very basic uh, and, and very deep problems. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, giving us any kind of guarantees or any kind of certainty, or in this, uh, in the sense, knowledge. Now, of course, you might say, well, gosh, if we, you know, uh, you know, if we want to take this this skeptical worldview seriously, it seems like we have to uh, abandon any sort of uh, confidence in science, which seems to be uh, wrong-headed given the success of science in the modern world. But again, most of that seems to be a misunderstanding of what science and the scientific method really is. Instead of being, uh, you know, skepticism being opposed to science and the scientific method, I think when you look at it the way that Popper looks at it, and again, many scientists do, science is skepticism. That is, if skepticism is being committed to the idea that you might very well be wrong and trying to look for any possible way in which you might be wrong, science is doing the same thing. Scientists, uh, you know, the, the success of science is explained by its unwillingness to rest content with any easy confirmation and instead to rigorously think how can we be wrong and how can we prove it right science is very much more about testing about finding what isn't the case right about finding sources of error and trying to you know come up with ways of eliminating them and in that sense shares much more in common with skepticism than you might ordinarily think Right. So short of being opposed to science, skepticism uh, is, is an integral part of science and the scientific method and goes a long way to explaining its success and the esteem that we should hold science and the scientific method to.